The Purple Line is a community podcast, bringing you in-depth conversations with diverse leaders in the public and private sectors. Whether you're a student looking to gather advice or a professional tuning in for valuable resources, our dynamic programming provides tips for all ages and backgrounds. I'm your host, Keith Fernandez, and this is The Purple Line. On today's episode, I'm sitting down with Chile President and CEO Marianne Gomez Orta to discuss her experience and background from corporate America to the nonprofit world. Marianne was formerly with Coors Brewing Company and McDonald's Corporation as a corporate marketing executive. She's a National Alliance Development Consultant with the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America and was a Hispanic Accounts Business Development Executive with public relations firms. Marianne has served on local, regional, and national nonprofit boards focused on education, small business, and health since graduating from college. Currently, Marianne serves on the Board of Trustees at St. Mary's College of California and on the boards of the Hispanic Association on Corporate Responsibility, American Latino Veterans Association, and is a national advisor for Hispanos Organized for Political Equality. Mrs. Orta is a teacher at heart. She has taught at American University, University of Phoenix, and Heald College. She has completed leadership and coaching programs by the John Maxwell Leadership, Accomplishment Coaching, Center for Creative Leadership, and the Emily Post Institute. In addition, she earned a BA in communications at the University of the Pacific in Stockton, California, and an MBA at St. Mary's College in Moraga, California. All right, welcome to the Purple Line Podcast, a newly relaunched Purple Line Podcast, first one of 2022. I'm Yay! excited. How about you? Yes. Oh my gosh. Um, I remember listening to this podcast uh, through Chile, so I'm so excited to be hosting today. I'm so excited to be here with you, Marianne Gomez Orta, President and CEO of Chile, friend of mine for a long time. Uh, Way too long because uh, you were you were really young when you started at Chile. Yeah, it's it's right, okay. Right. You, know, you, you were 15, and, you know, and, and you've been yeah. here for a while. Um, thank you for joining us. So, first of all, how are you? How, how's everything going? Doing well. Um, super excited to relaunch uh, this podcast. Um, kind of like at the same time, everybody's kind of like relaunching a new life, you know, transforming back into hybrid, virtual, in-person, whatever you want to call it. So um, very excited about that. Very excited for different opportunities and what we're planning for Chile. And um, yeah, I'm also like finishing up 10 years of being wow. with Chile. So that's a whole new transformation. So I'm super excited about it. That's awesome. I can't even count to 10, so I'm thrilled about this. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's, it's wonderful. And I know Chile has so many exciting programs coming up. You just wrapped up a tech talk recently. Um, really incredible, incredible stuff. Um, and you know, as part of your regular programming, you have the trade symposium, you have a gala, you know, really leading the right. conversation in Washington and across the country. So uh, I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, I am a really old alumnus, of course, uh, 2006, so just don't backdate me and you know, folks can, yeah. folks can know, but um, the growth has been incredible. Um, and I'm really excited to talk to you today because we're talking about transformations and transforming from, in this case, corporate America and leading uh, as a Hispanic leader in corporate America and becoming a nonprofit leader um, where it's cause-based, it's advocacy-based, and it's really based on uh, standing up for the community. So. Right. Um, I've seen the growth of your organization, and first of all, thank you for what you've done because I've seen this grow over and over again uh, exponentially and by leaps and bounds. So, uh, as an alumnus, it's, uh, yeah, it's you're, you're mucho mucho welcome. I, it's, well, been, it's it's a lot of fun. It's a uh, it's a great commitment, and it just it just fills my cup every day. I it, overflowing. Yeah. Uh, so let's get into it. So tell me a little bit about your background, how you got to the nonprofit world. I mean, I certainly know, but I know our listeners are really curious. Yeah. So um, I really entered into kind of this whole advocacy part at a, at a young age, um, mainly because I grew up in a farm worker camp. I grew up in a farm worker camp outside of Stockton, California, a 45 minute drive from what I used to call civilization. Uh, which is where you know I-5 and Charterway met and that's where kind of like everything else happened and so you know growing up in an environment like that it, you it's kind of like you're automatically an advocate right. uh, there's just so many things growing up in those environments uh, my, my dad um, came to the United States as a bracero uh, my mom uh, born and raised in Texas worked at cotton fields when she was young um, so just just their stories alone, you know, are just so enriching. And so for me, I really started in nonprofit kind of advocacy at a young age. But it, what really did it, uh, and and 
if you go on my LinkedIn page or my profile, you'll see how it really started because I'm very open about it. And that's when I took on the elementary school board of directors of my baby sister. Um, they wanted to do redistricting, long story. They had no you know, authority to do that on their own. And that's you know, also when I had to like type literally a letter to elected officials on a royal typewriter. Like, does anybody know what that is? Oh my um, and so, so just really kind of diving into it. So I kind of grew, grew up with it. And then when I went to college, uh, of course, because of that, and I was also part of a scholarship program, I just jumped in and helped out create leadership conferences on campus uh, with other students. And so when I graduated from college and I started working in public relations firms, I just really wanted to dive into that nonprofit world because it just felt right to me on, on different levels. And I got involved with the Heart Association, and that was like the first big nonprofit. You know, it's a big nonprofit, but I was at the, right. at the local chapter. Right. But that's really where I learned how to work for a nonprofit and what that was all about. But it wasn't my regular day job. Right. Right. And, and that's really important because you're so associated with not just Chile, but, you know, the boards of directors that you've been on, boards of trustees. Um, and I think people jump to the conclusion that you've always been a nonprofit leader, but you haven't. You've been a corporate leader. Right. You've been in marketing for major corporations. Um, and so tell me a little bit about how you decided to, first of all, work in corporate America, which, I mean, being Hispanic at the time, I'm sure it was a totally different place than it is today, <laughs> right. uh, to say the least. And then... Tell me a little bit about how those lessons served you uh, as you made the jump to being a full-time nonprofit leader. So I wasn't really, I never really thought about going into corporate. I, I really, my background is in PR and marketing. And so I love the idea of just, I was going to be, you know, with public relations firms for like forever. Yeah. Um, my idea was to go work for a global firm and then travel the world. And the reason I love that is because I just love the variety. And I need to always constantly be learning. So working with different clients just was awesome because I got to learn um, about so many different things. But at some point, I just decided, you know, I just really need to do something different. And um, I was working on a big project for, for the, a PR firm that I was a partner in at the time and working on a big project, a big festival for the Sacramento Bee newspaper as they were like the main, main yeah. sponsors. Yeah. And it was just so much fun to work with all these different companies. And then all of a sudden, someone who I was working with there at the Sacramento Bee literally, you know, taps your shoulder and says, hey, I just got a phone call from a friend at Coors Brewing Company and they're looking for someone that's gonna do A, B, and C. And I just thought you'd be perfect for the job. And Literally, that's, I hadn't even really thought about it. So it's kind of like, you know, just, just doing your work, but doing it so well and being open and just connecting with people. I had an opportunity to apply for this job. I got the job. And so I was doing um, corporate marketing for Coors Brewing Company. Again, not like the best known, you know, good citizen, corporate citizen company in the Hispanic community at the time. But... But they were doing their best and they were actually responding to the needs of the community by hiring um, diverse people yeah. in different departments. So I took that as a great opportunity, of course, at the time, right, because I didn't know anybody else in corporate America. So they told me what the salary is yeah, and yeah. they told me what the benefits are going to be. I'm like, yeah, 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 sign me up. Sounds all good. Like, I didn't know you could negotiate. Yeah. You could do all that kind of stuff. Like, nobody tells you, right? So... I just jumped in and I, I met some great people. I, I still have some really good friends that we stay connected from our beer days. And, and then later on, I got tapped again by somebody at McDonald's Corporation. So both jobs were in the regional office in, in Northern California. Right. But was it like a pinch yourself moment when you got there and you're like, oh my God, I'm working at McDonald's, you know, and I'm working at McDonald's in, a, in, a, in an authoritative <laughs> right. way. And when you grow up, like it, it seems like, at least, you know, for me growing up in Miami, some of the things that I've been privileged enough to do because, you know, I've had a great support network and it says a lot about the community and not so much about me, um, mm -hmm. is I go, you know, just, it seems so far away from where I grew up. 
Um, you right. know, living in Washington, you know, the capital steps away. Um, just, it seems so crazy to me. And so what was that like, you know, just stepping into that role and, and yeah, being like, it was, I'm a corporate leader now. It, it was, um, it's kind of one of those things sometimes like you're just like so determined that you're going to do it yeah. and you don't really think about those things. Yeah. And so I remember when I, because I was very involved in the Sacramento Hispanic Chamber, very involved in the community, and this is in the late 90s, and there was just this awesome group of diverse leaders yeah. in the area and it didn't really hit me until like I would talk to family or friends and I would tell them you know and they ask you what you do and and God bless a lot of family members they still didn't even know what I did right they I, I, say I, I, I talk same. about community and marketing and they still kind of look at me and then I'd say you know well I basically sell beer right and they're like oh, oh that's so cool right, wow right, right, right. right. But then that also meant that every time you had to come back, you had to show up with beer. Oh yeah. Right? And then when I went on to work at McDonald's Corporation, that was quite of a jump because McDonald's is the number one in that category. Yeah. Right? So when you go work for a company that's in that top tier, it does really feel different. Like you get a whole different vibe just by going and walking into a regional office. Yeah. Let alone flying into Chicago and, and going to Oak Brook and kind of being like people kind of people like rolling out a little bit of a red carpet for you and I'm like I just work for McDonald's like what's the big deal um, so so you do have to kind of also check yourself yeah. and and at, and then at the same time be able to I think especially those of us that grow up in communities that didn't have I'm a big believer that when we do have, it's our obligation to share yeah. and bring other people to the fun yeah. and bring other people in. Maybe they don't end up working for the company, but I, I did. I went out of my way in my little marketing team to hire an Asian American, an African American. And, you know, we were like the three musketeers that were the most diverse department um, in a lot of offices. Yeah. So, so that was also really cool is to really look at Yes, it's different, and there were a lot of lessons learned, but, you know, okay, so how do I use it? How do I leverage this for, for good? Yeah, yeah, and I mean, and, and that's, that really ladders well into our, my next question, because a lot of leadership is making room for, at the table for people, right? Right. And it's making room at the table for voices that might not have been heard. So, I know there is, no matter the industry you're in, if you're in politics, you lead a certain way, if you're in corporate, you lead a certain way, if you're not profit, you lead a certain way, but um, what are the evergreen lessons that you think apply to leadership, whether you're a corporate leader, whether you're a nonprofit leader, whether you're a political leader, um, you know, some political leaders, you know, nowadays it's, it's a little bit more difficult than before, but, you know, what does service look like to you? So, great question. Um, I, I'm a big believer that leadership so I'm also a big John Maxwell fan, yeah. uh, and so I just really believe that the leadership is really about influence. So first off, it's not about the title yeah. that you have. Uh, it's really more about what you bring to the table, um, how you represent yourself and how you represent others, but really what are, what are you doing to give back? Yeah. So I mean, if you're giving back, by the nature of just what you do and how you do it and who you're working with and who you're giving back to, you're a leader. Yeah. You're a leader. And so it doesn't really matter if you're in a corporate environment or a nonprofit or even elected official or appointed. It, it really doesn't matter to me that the, the idea of the leadership is really about the influence. And if you're in that type of a position, whether it's by title or not, is to be there for people. And to be a servant leader doesn't necessarily mean that's only applicable if you're a government employee right. or a nonprofit employee. I mean, I was always in corporate America and, and doing some nonprofit. Um, I remember the funny thing when I worked at Coors Brewing Company and I was involved with the Heart Association, I, I really pushed the Heart Association to do more in the Hispanic community. Yeah. And, you know, we had the directories and, you know, back in the day, everything was printed and we had packets. And I remember people at meetings saying, 
you know, doctor so and so, the cardiologist, like everybody's a doctor yeah. almost, right? Or worked at a hospital. And then there's Marianne with Coors Brewing Company. People are like, what is a beer person doing with the American Heart Association? And there's a lot to that, but it it didn't it doesn't it shouldn't matter, right? right? So I'm contributing. I'm also learning mm -hmm. a lot. And you never know where those lessons are going to take you, and you never know where those relationships are going to lead. So leadership really, to me, is about influence and being of service and value to others. You know, I, I heard a couple of things here, and I love bridging the gap, because I think one of the things with our community, bridging the gap between just knowledge is um, the difference between hard and soft skills. So, you know, when I grew up, you know, I think my grandparents were very good at teaching me hard skills, like get an education, learn right. how to do this, you know, my case. You know, learn how to do a press release and, you know, learn how to do all that kind of stuff. But the soft skills is so interesting and it's one of the things I really admire about you that you go out of your way to teach uh, young people soft skills, like how to influence without authority, how to bring people right. around to your point of view um, and, and not force them to convince them that you have a compelling argument and to do so in a way that um, is respectful of their point of view right. and also gets buy in so they join your cause willingly. Um, and so, I mean, when it comes to the Hispanic community, sometimes, like, what's, what are some of the ways, I think, in which we can help encourage people to develop those soft skills and make it part of their professional curriculum so they can be successful like you and have a career like you did where you were able to use those soft skills and deploy them for good? So I think that um, the, the soft skills training, right, because yeah. we don't get that in school. Right. Uh, or at home sometimes. You know, well, and, and sometimes yeah. we do at home, but we get kind of like soft slash hard, yeah. you know, and it's, you know, I grew up with the tough love, which, you know, I, you know, I still am. Yeah. But, but part of it, I think, is that we, we feel like we're going to learn certain things in school. Okay, and we do. And then we feel like we're going to learn certain things at a job or at an internship. And you kind of do, but I really encourage people to push yourself to actually be involved in different things. Because you need to put yourself in different situations with different people. So think about it this way. Put yourself in a situation with a different kind of group of people that aren't your coworkers, right? So they don't they won't know if you messed up the same way. They won't, they won't, they're not waiting for you to pass on something. You're not waiting for them to pass something on to you. So Sharpening your skills, which is what I really learned as well from being with nonprofits, but they weren't my job, right? So I had my regular job, but then going to work for or serving on a committee for a nonprofit, I developed my negotiating skills. I developed how to talk to strangers. I developed um, public speaking skills so I could bring them to work. Yeah. And then at work, I kind of sharpen them a little bit. And then if I needed to learn something else, I'd go back to the different nonprofit committees that I worked in and I'd kind of play in that sandbox yeah. and then figure that out. So as an example, my background is not in finance. Mm -hmm. It's not in budget planning. I'm good at it now. I've been running a nonprofit. You, you've got to know budgeting, finance, how to talk to accountants and auditors, right? But when I didn't know how to do that, when I was on a committee for the Heart Association, I said, you know, I want to I want to serve on the Budget and Finance Committee. Yeah. And they're like, why? And I go, because I want to learn that. And you need some more women on your committee. So sign me up. And, and then I learned. And I learned the language. And I learned how to do the reports. So I could take that and apply it at work. And I could also apply it to the community work and other areas that I did. And so it was just different little stepping stones. And so I encourage people to don't just look at where you work mm -hmm. as the all like, oh my gosh, they have to train me on this and I got to learn that. Like there's so many resources now that you, that I didn't have. Like first off, like the internet, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like email, yeah. uh, like Google. Yeah. Um, but the, the core of the leadership is the people to people relationships and you're not going to really hone in those soft skills until you're around other people. So put yourself in those other people situations to learn. I, I agree. So first of all, it sounds like I should call you for my taxes. So that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, and, no. Uh, oh. <laughs> I have a good accountant. Oh, oh, okay, good, good. You got to give me the number. Um, and, and I think you're right. And, and being 
and talking to people is just such an undervalued skill. And I think that one of the thing, one of the things that really is helpful is when you just kind of lose that fear, which is tough, right? Because folks, right. So folks stuff, right. you know, are, are afraid of going up to a stranger and be like, "Hi, this is me." Um, so it's it's really it's it's great, but it's it's tough. And I guess one of the questions I have is: we talked a lot about your life, your experiences, and how is that informed how you run Chile? How has that informed how you show up and advocate every day? So as I uh, mentioned earlier, um, it'll be uh, next month in May oh my God. will be the same time 10 years ago that it was the first time yeah. um, at a Chile Gala and running a gala. And I said at that evening that I always consider where I came from and two people in mind that you don't see in Washington. They don't hang out here at the bars. Yeah. You don't see them at the briefings. And that's my mom and dad. And so I really think about when I hear things about equity, when I hear about uh, paying interns, when I hear about you know access to rural communities, access to anything, I always think, okay, would we have access to that in the farm worker camp? Would mom and dad even understand that? Um, and so they're my filter. Yeah. They're kind of like, I run things through that, you know, yeah. mentally and kind of check, okay, and then I think about when I was a student then, what did I need? Now, of course, today's students are like way ahead of the game um, compared, but there's some basics that still are the same. Yeah. Like if you grow up in certain environments, you don't know what you don't know. Right. You only know your immediate family. Um, you're lucky if you had a high school counselor that was supportive. Yeah because we don't have the same number of high school counselors now. Um, you know, I never was able to go to a high school dance. I went to two football games the whole four years. Mm -hmm. This is not a confession. I know it's starting to sound like No, it, no, but, it's okay. But, I, um, I've got those but, you know, but I, already, I already complained to my mother about it's, it many it's times. It's okay. Nobody wanted to go with me. Yeah, so, so, <laughs> <laughs> so part of it is that when you... So I think about that and I think, you know, there's a lot of people that didn't have what you... You know, the experiences of yeah. what you want, see on TV shows, yeah. right? I mean, I, I watched those TV shows and I thought, man, that'd be so cool to have that. Right. But so I think part of it is that, that it's important to stay grounded. And this is the kind of town where you could easily get jaded yeah. and, you know, lose track. But I'm also a teacher at heart. So I love the fact that every quote, you know, spring and fall, there's yeah. new interns in, in Washington. There's a new buzz because of you know young adults and and then the summers are always awesome because we have thousands of interns in town and tourists and um, I love giving the tourist directions on the street so it's just kind of random. I I, I love it and and I like that you mentioned uh, interns but before we get to interns the one question I've always had for you is why did you apply to Chile? Why did you apply? What, what did you see in Chile yeah. almost 10 years ago, right. well, about to be, that you said, I can grow this organization, keep it rooted in its values, and this is a place where I can make my mark? So the, a couple of things that I think were for me is that I, you know, I, you know one of my personal models is, has always been that um, I really believe that diverse points of view create you know, exponentially better results for all. Yeah. Not that it's easy. No. And not that it's, you know, quick. Um, and, you know, there's detours along that way. But I just, I just always loved that. I just always loved about, you know, the vision statement of Chile and, and really holding to that diversity of thought because we really are all very different, even with, you know, among the Hispanic community. So that was one. The other was the opportunity to work with students. I've always enjoyed working with college students. Don't give me high school students, but I, I love college students. Um, and I'm the eldest of five, so okay, it's just kind of a natural thing for me to really enjoy working with college students and, and seeing how I can contribute. Um, I've taught at universities before, so I thought, well, I can bring some of the corporate experience. I know how to pitch and ask for fundraising from corporates because I've been on the other side. I know how to develop curriculum because I've done that in classrooms for universities. Um, and vocational schools and you know it's kind of like what my dad said um, you know when I first told him that I was moving to Washington and I said oh dad what if what if I don't really like it you know what if 
What if they don't treat me right? Mm -hmm. What if there's just more discrimination? What yeah. if it's just... And he looked at me and he says, ah, well, you have a home to come back to. You just come back. And I thought, well, first of all, pretty smart for a man that only has a third grade education from Mexico. Um, and, you know, I do have a home to come back to. Not everybody has a home to come back to. So I think that was the other part for me is, could I help somebody be part of their home and be an extension of their home like others have been for me? Right. And, and so that, that's still every, you know, every few months, it's, it's, I'm, I'm reminded of, and that's why I'm still here and I love it. It's, it's, it's incredible. It's a testament to your leadership. It's, you, you have this Marianne alumni network. I mean, it's Chile alumni network, right? but it's also a Marianne alumni <laughs> yeah. network. Um, you know, and I think that, you know, you mentioned you being the oldest of five is really important because you've always been a teacher and a leader at heart. And um, I feel like that's really the crux of how Chile has shown up in so many people's lives, especially under your leadership and, uh, and Lincoln's leadership as well. Um, what inspired you to, to embrace that role? Because there are elder siblings who are like, no, 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 the responsibility. Oh, um, yeah. And, and, oh, but, yeah. You make it sound like I loved it from the beginning. Well, I hated it. Oh, oh, no, oh my God. Sorry. I hated being the... So I would pray every night to God to bring me a big sister or a big brother because I was convinced that yeah. there, there had to be a different, there had to be. There's a better so, way somewhere. Yeah. yeah. Somebody's got to tell me yeah. because I keep messing up apparently according to my mom and dad. Um, but I, I just, I hated it. Yeah. I, I didn't like the one, so I got spanked first if my sister's messed up because I, apparently I didn't teach them right. Talk about that. Or sure. totally. Um, and then um, one, one sister in particular would love that. Okay. Like, I think she did it on purpose to mess up or something. Um, but that's okay, I got back to her years later. <laughs> so, um, so I just didn't, I didn't, it's not that I didn't like the responsibility. Right. I didn't understand it. Right. I, I didn't understand responsibility. I didn't understand the accountability. And it was kind of dumped on me, literally. So when you're young, you just don't get it. Right. Uh, and it wasn't until probably high school when my uh, brother was, he was born when I was a sophomore in high school, mm -hmm. so I instantly kind of became, you know, mini mom. Yeah. And then I started really thinking more about responsibility, accountability, and what that meant. And you're in high school and you're learning different things. And so it really wasn't until then that I thought, you know, I guess I'm kind of good at this. Yeah. Um, and it's hard because my dad's the eldest of eight. Wow. And my mom is the second eldest of eight. So all they've known is being the eldest too. Yeah. So they didn't know any different. And so they role modeled how to take care of siblings, how to take care of other people, how to respond when someone calls and says, I need help or, yeah. you know, so I, I grew up with that. Yeah. Um, and so I adopted my version of big brothers and big sisters <laughs> at a young age. They were all just at home, so, yeah. Uh, you know, I had a neighbor who, I was playing the flute in elementary school and she played the flute and she brought me in every now and then and she'd teach me how to play and um, she also kind of taught me other things in life that a big sister would probably teach you, mm -hmm. right? And um, she had an older brother and so they, they, they kind of took me in as a big brother, big sister and to this day, kind of interesting enough, the majority of my really close friends are older than me. Um, because that's just kind of like you don't even realize it sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I have obviously some really close friends from, from college, but um, the ones who really taught me a lot were really the big brothers and big sisters that I adopted along the way. That's, that's awesome. I feel like it's about creating community and, and creating leadership lessons uh, in that way. And so um, one of the things that always stands out to me is how you are able to model leader, being a leader and being a teacher for the uh, Chile alumni and for current Chile interns.
the skill sets they have learned over time, I've been, I've been able to see them grow over time um, through the Alumni Association and through different things that have been right. involved with Chile, um, is that they model, they model leadership and mentorship, um, you know, a lot, a lot like you. Um, but I don't think it's obvious to them day one, right? They get here, everything is really new. Um, what advice would you give to a prospective global leader or really anybody who's a young person looking to make their way in Washington or a professional city and how to model those um, qualities that you embody? So thank you, I appreciate that. Um, it also sounds kind of scary. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it does. <laughs> it's like, it's oh just... my gosh, how many interns are like doing things that I told them to do? Oh my God, I hope they're behaving. And it's they're good doing advice. The right, they're doing the right it's ones. It's good advice. Um, so, like I mentioned earlier, I think that it's our obligation yeah. to kind of uh, pay it forward yeah. and, and pay it back. And sometimes it means pulling up a little bit, sometimes it means pushing a little bit, and that comes also from my, you know, my days of being a big sister, which, yeah. of course, you can't shake off. But yeah. I think part of it is whether you're going to be a Chile Global Leaders intern, you know, we also have a communications fellowship program. Uh, we have a law fellowship program yeah. now in the summer. Uh, regardless of that, say you're just, you know, you're an intern yeah. someplace else, or you're thinking about an internship program. My challenge to you is push yourself a little bit to not hang out with the same people. Yeah. Um, you're never going to learn and grow if you're always with the same people, the same club. Um, you know, and it sounds silly sometimes, but even go to a different Starbucks. Yeah. Go to a different coffee shop every now and then. Just get your mind wrapped around new stuff because then that's when you really start to grow and you start to build your confidence. Oh, okay, well, I know how to order at Starbucks, but I'm just going to order someplace else. Um, I you know, want to be able to go to this uh, new place and make new friends. Um, it's just kind of getting yourself a little bit out of that. And then the other piece is there are so many opportunities, not just in DC, but in other places for interns to interact with other people your same age that I didn't have growing up. And so there's Meetup, there's, you know, Eventbrite has all kinds of things that you can do online or you can meet with people in person. Um, so, you know, whatever your interests are, you know, I remember uh, a couple of interns who were really interested in soccer and I introduced him to a friend of mine who is a big like he goes to every World Cup oh, wow. and so I introduced them to him and I told him I said you know he'll tell you where to go hang out and meet other people for soccer in town so sometimes again it's kind of just getting yourself out of like everything has to be work related yeah. it doesn't have to be work related um, because you meet some really cool people sometimes that have nothing to do with your job yeah. and you never would have met them had not been for that other thing yeah. other than jobs. Yeah, so diversity of thought comes from diversity of experience. Basically. Totally, you're never gonna, yeah. you're never gonna do that. It, it's just like with your own family. Yeah. You just need to get a little bit out of that range, right? And then, you know, maybe you need to go talk to that tío or tía that you haven't talked to in a long time, yeah. right? And have a completely different genuine conversation with them. Um, or how, or invite yourself, especially if it's a relative, to take you someplace else. Yeah. Um, so it's it, you can't really appreciate other people's points of view and appreciate their experiences without you having done that yourself, mm -hmm. right? So it's kind of like people say you can't love somebody else truly until you love and respect yourself. So it's kind of the same thing. Like you're really never going to embrace and understand, or at least respect somebody else's point of view. And the fact that they've been in a different environment, if you've never done that yourself, yeah. if you're always in the same type of environment, well then of course you're always going to clash with other people because you don't even know how to behave yeah. in an environment where someone thinks differently than you. It's just not, it's, it's just not in your DNA because you've never, you've never given your ch yourself a chance to even try it. That's awesome advice. And you know, what's, what, what was great for me when I first came to D.C. Uh, as a Chile intern back in the Stone Age uh, <laughs> was that, feels like it after a while, um, was that um, there was this network, this support network. 
you know, I came to DC, I had been here in a, on a middle school trip, that was about it, I had never lived alone, um, so it was all new to me, I saw these blue and white right. horrible suits, your sucker suits, I love them now, <laughs> yeah. I, I really do, it's, it's a, yeah. the bait of my fashion existence, but I do love them, um, but it was so alien to me. Uh, but I had this support network, and I had this network of folks, you know, Chili staff, uh, you know, I knew Eliana ross Layton and over back then, too. I um, right. still do today, but I mean, she was in Congress, and I was uh, going to work for Mel Martinez, who was a senator at the time, as a Chile intern. And I think what was really helpful to me was that I had a built-in support network, because through this organization, through people I knew here, but what about people who just come to DC and you know we have the saying the cuatro gatos you know they don't even but but I mean right. they, they don't even know one gato so I mean right. what, what what is what is that like and what advice would you give to someone starting out on oh, their own that's and, awesome and, yeah yeah so I'm, I'm just having flashbacks to literally like 2009 yeah. when I moved to DC for the first time and I literally moved here because I was always the one as the eldest encouraging my sisters and my brother to go away to school, go study abroad, you know. Uh, of course, I would also remind them, you only get these opportunities because I didn't mess it up. <laughs> I just got to be really honest about that. But, you, you know, leverage, leverage those opportunities. Yeah. Um, and um, so it was just really different for me because I, I reached the point in, in Sacramento, California, where it's like, I just, I just felt like doing something different and I really needed to do something different and be in a different environment. And... I, I reached out to friends that I had worked with before through the other work that I had done at uh, McDonald's and Coors and the uh, public affairs work that I did for the Pharmaceutical Association. And I just called a few friends and I said, hey, I'm, I'm looking for something different. I'm look and two people came back and said, you will be really good for a nonprofit in Washington. And I'm like, really? Well, let's try this out. So I started applying for different jobs. I applied for a job in Washington. I interviewed, was super excited. I didn't get the job. But then the HR consultant who was working that assignment basically called me up afterwards. And she said, you know, I know you didn't get this job, but there's just something about you that I really liked. And I want to help you get a job in Washington. And so between her and the other two people that I knew, I literally did like the sofa surfing, you know, like I, I, I looked at the schedule of when all the big events were going to be taking place in Washington. I saved up my money and I'm like, okay, this, this week in March is when A, B and C is happening. So I call a buddy and I'm like, Hey, I need your sofa for like four days because I'm going to be there this week and I'm going to look for jobs. Yeah. And that's just kind of how it started. Then, you know, when I got here, like there's that excitement to get here, right? And then you get here and you're like, oh my God, I'm here. Hello. <laughs> uh, like these friends, I just can't keep sofa surfing. I'm like, here, yeah. I got my own sofa. Yeah. You know, I got my own bed. Um, so I did get a little bit of that imposter syndrome, even, you know, at an older age. And imposter syndrome isn't just for recent college graduates. Yeah. It's, it, it hits us at all different levels. And so it was a little challenging at first to kind of figure that out. But I think that I had the good skills and the good training to just figure out, okay, you know what, today I'm gonna meet one new person. Yeah. And I'm gonna have a really good conversation with one new person. And that's it. Yeah. And you know, little by little, you end up meeting more people and, uh, you know, that's, that's good because at the same time, the cool thing about coming into a new town is that nobody knows you from before, you know? So they're only gonna know what you tell them. So if you don't want them to, nobody to know about, you know, blah, 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 don't tell anybody, right? You have a fresh start, yeah. which is actually kind of cool. Yeah, that's, which, is, which is exactly, like, which is why I love people's professional growth stories because, you know, that is, sort of how you become who you want to be because no one is not written in the stars that you know this person will be president or this person will be a doctor it's you know how you um you know grow and shape your own story um, right which is um which brings me to like back in 2003 i mean first of all calling somebody wait what like who calls anybody on the phone anymore? right like, <laughs> no, like no that's the, i i answer like three people's phone calls and that's it and i'm like otherwise yeah you know, like, um but 2003 become president and ceo of chile um, and it's, it's 
been, it's going to be a decade soon, as we've mentioned. And so how did you grow an organization and continue, continue to have a, a really strong anchor in its values? Um, because one thing I love about Chile is that its real true mission statement has not changed. You know, embracing right. diversity right. of thought. And so I think, you know, mission creep is really easy. You know, you can, you start doing one thing and then, you know, a year and a half later, you're like, oh my God, I have 10 new things I was doing that was not, that were not part of my mission. So how do you keep it tightly focused, growing programs, um, growing its reputation and influence in Washington uh, and across the country, frankly, um, but with, with, you know, just keeping its soul, frankly. Yeah, so first I just need to, to correct. Um, the organization started in 2003. I was not there in the very oh, beginning. Okay, so okay, okay. Um, so we had a, a, the original um, executive director yeah. was um, Octavio and yeah. uh, And, you know, I joined in 2011. So there, there was already some foundation, but it was new. Right. Um, and it's kind of one of the newer, younger organizations, I should say, that we kind of refer to as, you know, what I say, the brother-sister organizations yeah. in town. It's, it's a little bit younger. But this is where I learned a lesson in corporate America, actually. In, in corporate America, I remember when I was at Coors, we always talked about what products we were promoting. Mm -hmm. How much time does each product get, right? How, what's the budget? Uh, for these different products? What's an emerging market where you're going to go launch that product? And if you're going to launch a new product, are you going to be cannibalizing yeah. another product, right? So there's a lot of analysis into a new program mm -hmm. that's kind of similar to a new product. Mm -hmm. Are you going to roll it out? Is it big? Is it small? Is it a pilot project? Uh, and then when I went to McDonald's, um, I remember conversations with different people in McDonald's because it was a at a time at the company, the corporation, where a group of franchisees decided to sell hot dogs. And there was another group of like, we can't sell hot dogs. And they started selling hot dogs and it got messy and they weren't doing well. And so the CEO was like, that's why we stick to what we do well. We do hamburgers well. That's what we're gonna stick to, no more hot dogs. And so that kind of stayed with me too. like. Stay with what you're good at yeah. and build on it. And because I also had the experience of working on committees for nonprofits, I knew the importance to your point of not getting into that mission creep because then you start to not only lose your focus and the, the, the drive, but you, you confuse people. Yeah. Like you confuse sponsors, you confuse followers, you confuse people that want to be part of the group. Because if you keep changing your mind about one program or you're just chasing the money, yeah. you know, because I know some nonprofits that do that too. They're like, oh, so and so has a lot of money. We're just going to do that project. Mm -hmm. But it has really that, it's not really focused on your mission. Yeah. Um, so, you know, over the years, uh, regardless of who the president of the United States is or who's leading in Congress, we've always stayed true to the mission. And people have asked, now how do you do that? And like, you just stay in your lane. Yeah. I mean, it's really not that hard. You can be very creative in your own lane. Yeah. Uh, you don't have to creep into somebody else's business. And there's a lot of great Hispanic organizations, both based in here in Washington and based across the country that that serve all kinds of purposes. So why get into somebody else's business? You know, just just do your business and do it well. And so I think that's also a good thing for people to focus on and that we really focus on with, with interns and staff is this is the space we're in. You know, sometimes we can partner with somebody else, right, to kind of dabble a little bit maybe into something else, see if that's going to work for us. And maybe it does, and maybe it doesn't, but you know, we don't sell, don't sell stuff that is not your, you know, your, that you're not a master at. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no hot dogs is good advice for me for this week. So <laughs> yeah. I'm going to take that nutritional advice. <laughs> yeah. I just can do it. I love yeah. hot dogs. I need, yeah. to, I need to not have yeah. so much. Beer does time. go well with hot dogs. No, so, no, you know, I that's another, yeah. you're, you're not helping. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what's the thing you're most excited about uh, within the next year for Chile? Um, what, what? What wakes you up in the morning and you go, I need to go do that? Like, that's the most exciting part of my job or parts. Uh, well, first of all, just super blessed yeah. to have this opportunity. Um, 
you know, having 30 bosses, you know, 10 members of Congress and 10 and 20 corporate executives, and then an advisory council of 20 people. Um, I don't think about it that much with that many people until people ask me, then I'm like, oh yeah, that's a lot of bosses. <laughs> um, but again, because of my PR background, mm -hmm. managing multiple projects and clients, it it's okay for me. I know that I'm not gonna get 30 different phone calls in one day. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's that's easy for me so I love being able to contribute so what I love is and I'm gonna have I kind of know what the calendars like yeah. right yeah. it's kind of the calendar that right. we can normally have right. but it's still really different yeah. because every day is a little different in Washington you get a lot of new people in Washington and and for me for the next year we're expanding um, we are adding research. We're gonna to bring to life the word institute in the Congressional Hispanic Leadership Institute. We've already started a little bit of research, so I'm not gonna give all that away. Um, Come on, Aiden, you'll, have to, you'll have to stay tuned right, and look right. to see what we're doing in research, but we've already started working on some research and we're looking at expanding that and doing a lot more. It won't be policy related. Mm -hmm. It'll be related to our core again. Great. What is it that we're good at? Um, we're also going to be increasing the number of interns that we have every year, which was, has always been a goal. Um, so we're, we're expanding that. Um, and we're going to get back out into different markets. So for, you know, we haven't the last few yeah. years, but we're going to start going out and having regional leadership conferences and, and doing that a little bit more as well. So I'm looking forward to that. I, I love that on the road again. Uh, yes. and, and speaking of on the road, as we wrap up, I've got two questions for you, not really chili related, but now that you're here. Sure. What is, it, you've spoken about how DC has changed your life professionally and personally. Um, so what's your favorite thing about being in DC and what's your favorite thing about being you right now? So my favorite thing about DC, uh, I think still is and always has been, just the buzz of people from all over the place. Yeah. Um, and, and it's that rare time you run into a Washingtonian, yeah. right? That you're like, what? You were born and raised here? From like, talk to me. Yeah. Uh, but I, I just love that there's people from all over the world. Um, growing up, and this is like really dating myself, but growing up, I used to watch this show, um, called The Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous. Oh yeah, Robin Beach. Oh my God. Okay, so you're dating yourself too. Oh, so no, I, 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 saw, I saw the okay. Ray Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, but what I loved about the show was that he went all over the world and talked to people from all over the world. Like, I really wasn't into like the hotels that much or whatever. Like, I just loved the food. Yeah. They talked about the different things that the tourists did. And these different conversations that he had, I just thought, wow, I want to, I want to be having some good wine and some good food in some other country. Yeah. Um, and I feel like I can do that in Washington. Yeah. I feel like I'm studying abroad all the time in Washington. Yeah. And when I get to go to other countries, it's just like that added value. Yeah. Um, and your second question about what being, being me yeah, at this it, time. Yeah. Your favorite part of your life right now. Well, I guess I should say it's being married. Um, you know, I met my husband. I love my husband, yes. Um, we met here in Washington. We met, he was also running a nonprofit. Yeah. Um, so there's benefits in doing nonprofit work. Yeah. Just for, you know, just to. <laughs> so that was that not on, on the brochure. That was not on the, yeah, that's not on the sales package. No, no. Um, but um, interesting enough, there have been people who have met yeah. um, on the board of Chile um, or in the office of Chile. Um, and I've been to some of those weddings. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but for me, it's just been nice that, uh, interesting enough, it's the first time that now my husband and I actually get to really enjoy Washington very differently as a married couple. Yeah. Because we were here, we lived outside of Washington for a little bit. That's when we got married. And then, you know, we moved back during the lockdown. Um, but like nobody's really seen us in town as a married couple. Yeah. So it's kind of like, again, kind of back to the very beginning, right? It's, it's a transformation time. It's the new beginnings. It's the springtime, which is my favorite season. Cause it's also my birthday. Um, so, you know, so that's about it. That's yeah. what I love. Well, that's awesome. So happy early birthday. Thank you. And, uh, 21 again. Of course. Yes. Of course. Well, 25 so you can rent a car. 
Yes, yeah, yes, so without the insurance. Right, right. Exactly. Right, yeah, that's, yeah. that's the little trick. Yeah, yeah, you don't want me driving it any age, so no worries <laughs> yeah. about that. But thank you so much for sharing this time with us. I'm so happy that you were able to stop by and um, incredibly uh, humbled by your leadership lessons and the way in which you lead every day. Well, thank you, and thank you again for, you know, signing up to lead the uh, Chile Alumni Association. Uh, very proud of you as well and your board, and um, the group is doing just some awesome work, and a lot of really good work too to to you and to the previous yeah. um, president who had to do everything virtual I know. and you know add value yeah. right during that time. So um, thank you again for relaunching the, the Purple Line uh, podcast. Love being here. Thank you, thank you, Marianne Gomez Workshop President and CEO of Chile on the Purple Line. Don't be a stranger. Thanks for listening to the Purple Line. You can follow me at underscore Keith Fernandez on Twitter. And make sure to follow Chili across all social media platforms at the Chili for the latest updates.